So, I'm sure you're hearing this song in 2023 and thinking, just how in the world did this happen? Rap, chore, be pure, take a tour, do the sword, I'll strain the rain, paint the train. How did a song containing what seems to be the pinnacle of Taylor Swiftian levels of white girl awkward imitation rap bars not only become a massive hit, but has gone on record as being respected by the greatest rappers in hip-hop, many of whom claim it as their favorite OG rap song? Well, I'll tell you how. It's a magical tale about Christmas and, well, racism in the music industry. But before we get to all that, this was a request by Flarboo. And if you'd like to make a song, movie, or album request, head on over to ko-fi.com slash rapcritic. Plus, get your request half off when you join the Patreon, where you can get early access to all my upcoming stuff as well as join the Discord for movie and game nights. Link's in the description below. So let's talk about Blondie. Now, I feel like the big hits from the band has kind of pushed them into being more in the poppy new wave 80s category, but originally Blondie was way more punk oriented. But the thing is, their brand of punk involved actively jamming other genres together, as a punk rock way of bucking all genre conventions in the first place. And in the late 70s, two genres were just beginning to take shape in the heart of New York City. There was hip hop and there was punk. Both were considered at the time to be their racial equivalent of the music you don't play on the radio. The white stations played rock and country, and the black stations played the funk and R&B. So often the punk kids and hip-hop kids would mix it up with each other when it came to the early clubs and house parties. So when it came to Debbie Harry, this wasn't like some outsider nobody knew trying to do a piss take of the scene. It was someone who was excited by its potential and wanted to hype it up any way she could. In fact, it was Debbie who was keying in the upscale industry cats like Nile Rodgers down to the local New York parties so he could see firsthand just how many people were sampling the bass line from his iconic Good Times record. However, the song we now know as Rapture wasn't originally going to be about hip-hop at all. It was supposed to be about Christmas. A Merry Christmas, a Merry Christmas rock, a Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas rock. Yeah, with the recent anniversary of the album this song comes from, they released the original demo for Rapture entitled The Yuletide Throwdown. I woke up in the morning, I had the munch, and then I reached for a bowl of Captain Crunch. And honestly, you don't need to listen to it. The, the rapping's even more jumbled and rambly. And when I put the crunch in the bowl, I found out the milk six weeks old. Yeah, it's basically that for six minutes. But originally, that was how the beat for Rapture sounded, way slower and darker like that. You see, originally Blondie came to Fab Five Freddy with the idea of doing a hip-hop homage track where she shouted out him and his friends, and although he was flattered, he turned it down at first, wanting the first possible crossover rap song to focus on something else as the topic and not just him and his boys. So they recorded this version, but shelved it at first, coming back a year later when they had the idea to speed up the tempo and change it back to being about hip-hop. And once they realized what a smasher they had on their hands, they hit up Freddy to get his blessing dropped it as a single and the rest is hip-hop history so when she drops that first line that was her setting the scene to invite you into the dopest parties in the city hosted by the man himself now all that history is beautiful and indicative of the racial harmony we could achieve with the power of music and all that positive happy shit but for real though how does it stack up as a song on its own at the end of the day well, it's certainly half good. That hook melody and instrumentation is still absolutely crusher, with its eerie minor melody and dark driving production, what with the ominous bells and pressing bluesy sax-driven backbeat. It's a legendary hook, come on, we all know the words, right? Step into a world. Wait. Wait uh, repeat that again? Oh, is it? Is that what she's saying there? Huh, that's not how I remembered it going. Maybe this is one of those songs where the iconic iteration of the hook is later in the track. You know, like how sometimes there'll be the cool sounding hook that comes in like the fourth time the hook happens and I'm just jumping the gun on it. Well, let's skip a little later in the song because now I need the catharsis of singing that damn hook. Stop it! Wait, what? Body muscular? the hell is going on in this hook? Like, geez, I, I thought the verses were confusing. I, I gotta figure out what the hell this hook's saying first. Uh, is the club attached to a shopping mall or something? I mean, it was the 80s. 
But okay, so we get to the song title, Rapture, a, a title that not only has the end of the world tone to it, but it also connotes to rapture as in overwhelming pure bliss, because uh, everyone's enjoying the music so much. But why do the words step into a world keep coming into my head? I don't know why I keep thinking. Oh, God damn it, I just realized what happened. I'm thinking of the KRS-One song that samples this one called Step Into A World, parenthesis, Rapture's Delight. Step into a world where there's no one left. Ah, my bad. And I probably messed it up because KRS-One's version has so much cleaner of a hook, like it only repeats that one couplet, so it probably stuck in my head better than anything here. I mean, I couldn't have even guessed at half the shit she says here. E-time technology? I don't recall ever hearing that phrase. What? A, a, a digital la a, what? But okay, if I try to be as charitable as I can, uh, the song is just supposed to be about weird stream of consciousness scene setting imagery. It, it meant to make you feel the energy and excitement of this new burgeoning hip hop nightlife scene. <laughs> I don't know why she's using these words to describe the scene, though. Barely breathing, almost comatose. What are you talking about? Have you ever seen a movie with house parties back in the 80s? Those mofos were doing the Roger Rabbit and jumping all over the place. Okay, now that sounds like a more accurate description. But all right, it, l let's get to what the verses were about. Cause sure, it definitely starts out shouting the hip hop cat she knows at the time. Flash is fast, flash is cool. And there's always been much hay made about what she's trying to say in these lines, uh, what with the band often incorporating a little bit of French into their lyrics every now and then. So from what I can tell here, after she shouts out the legendary DJ Grandmaster Flash, what she says is, Francois c'est pas Flash et no do. And with Francois being like a common French name, so like the French version of like a Tom, Dick, or Harry, she's saying like the average guy can't rock the party like Flash a no do, which translates to her like saying Flash and us, as in the band Blondie. Now she could be taking shots at the French house DJ Francois Kevorkian, who was also making noise in the area around this time, but at best it was probably just meant as another fun jab and a call out to yet another artist on the scene. What's especially funny to me is the Jean-Michel Basquiat cameo right when she starts rapping, because as someone who was deeper into the scene and actually spoke fluent French, well, it probably explains the barely held back laughter that's in his eyes here. However, anyone who's listened to the song remembers that it very quickly dissolves into one of the most confusing rap verses of all time. Like, there's a very particular motif that shows up. And out comes a man from Mars. If you go out at night, you can call you, and then you're in the man from Mars. When you don't stop, you keep on eating cars. Then, when there's no more cars, you go out at night and eat up Mars. Because the man from Mars is through with cars. He's Oh my god, shut the fuck up about cars and bars! Was that the only rhyme you could think of? And that's before we get into what she's actually saying, which, I mean, I'd call it apocalyptic if the imagery wasn't just so goddamn bizarre, it's impossible to follow. And sure, 80s rap in general was cheesier and more lighthearted than now, but even for the time, this was not a great example of what hip-hop sounded like. Like, yeah, there were guys with looser flows and bad rhymes, but, you know, that's just the law of averages for the quality of any medium of art. For real, don't get it twisted, the high caliber of stuff that was going on was way more skilled and complex than we often give them credit for. Remember, these guys had to rock crowds, so you better believe the creme de la creme like Melly Mel and Busy B were killers when it came to flipping clever words and phrases to keep the people's attention. Hell, when doing research for the time, I came across a track called Darth Vader vs. Blowfly, probably hip-hop's first sci-fi fanfic record. I said it would be a thrill, me and my carmobile was set for his black ass immediately. And when I get my hands on him, I'm gonna kick his ass repeatedly. And yeah, it's a goofy record by a Chitlin Circuit comedian, but you can see the seeds of a genre forming its conventions. Already, what's considered a hip-hop track is no stranger to tight cadences, multi-syllabic rhyme schemes, and a fully formed concept record. So yes, while our more hangdog flow is indicative of probably the average house party MC, there absolutely were guys who rocked parties that were coming with dope rhymes that made them stand out above the rest. So it becomes a thing where you kinda hope those people would get to represent hip-hop on the main stage first, you know, but eh, what are you gonna do? Again, that's not her fault, it's the fault of an industry that still hadn't gotten past its racial stigma of letting black people be the presenters of their own music. That said, we gotta talk about these rhymes, cause, whoo boy, they are atrocious. 
I mean, it's a flurry of words that comes at you where we somehow go from shouting out local hip hop acts to suddenly being about an alien encounter. And comes right down and lands on the ground and out comes a man from Mars and tries to run but he's got a gun. And then in a Hitchcockian twist of storytelling, it drops you, the main character, from the narrative and it now just becomes about the alien guy. And he shoots you dead and he eats your head. And then you're in the man from Mars. You go out at night eating cars. Wait, what? You eat Cadillac. Wait, wait, did you turn into the alien? Or like, when he eats you, does your consciousness get absorbed into his, where you can only see what he sees for the rest of your life as he continues to destroy everything on the planet you hold dear? Well, I... Sounds like a fucking killer Stephen King novel, honestly. Don't strain your brain, pain the train. You'll be singing in the rain. Say, don't stop, do punk rock. Man, it's so weird to think someone actually wrote this. Like, how is this not a drunken freestyle where she went on a lucid ramble just randomly incorporating the sights around her like some kind of blonde rapping Kaiser Soze? Well, now you see what you wanna be. Just have your party on TV Cause the man from Mars will beat up balls where the TV's on. Yeah, so to defeat the alien, turn on your TV and have a party on the television? Now he's gone back up to space where he would have a house with the human race. Well, you know what? If it'll end this madness, I'll take it. Overall, though, I give this a 2 out of 5. Her cadence itself isn't too bad. It's got a strong, haughty quality to it. Like, in the alternate universe where she's saying something that actually comes together as a story, this would be pretty cool. But as it is, it's hacky, even for early 80s rap standards. So, no, your ears don't deceive you. Everyone was aware of how corny the track sounded when it dropped. But the impact of breaking in a new genre that was bubbling just under the surface gives the track an undeniable legacy that helped open the floodgates for what was to come. And for that, it still deserves its props. I just wish I could show it more love as the iconic song it is, but writing-wise, it really needed a second past just to make it not so hokey or at least not go on for so damn long you know i would say it's the first science fiction rap verse but that would probably actually go to the blowfly song seriously guys go check out that record it's fucking awesome the captain called me in and said my friend we are about to come a thing of the past if you don't do something about dog beta he gonna fuck all of us in the ass never say i don't do anything for you guys okay well that's the episode Leave a like if you like because it helps, comment if you have something to say because it helps even more, and hit the subscribe and the bell because that's what helps the most. And if you want to support the show, of course, that's ko-fi.com slash rapcritic for one-time donations and patreon.com slash rapcritic for ongoing donations, where you get to see episodes early and join the RC Discord to chat with me and fellow fans. So until next time, I'm the Rap Critic. You don't have to like my opinion, but I don't have to like your song. Even if it is a classic. I don't play favorites with this shit, goddammit. Alright, fucking peace.